Forward. Alcoholics Anonymous is a worldwide fellowship of more than 100,000 alcoholic men and women who are banded together to solve their common problems and to help fellow sufferers in recovery from that age-old baffling malady, alcoholism. This book deals with the 12 steps and the 12 traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. It presents an explicit view of the principles by which AA members recover and by which their society functions. AA's 12 steps are a group of principles, spiritual in their nature, which, if practiced as a way of life, can expel the obsession to drink and enable the sufferer to become happily and usefully whole. AA's 12 traditions apply to the life of the fellowship itself. They outline the means by which AA maintains its unity and relates itself to the world about it, the way it lives and grows. Though the essays which follow were written mainly for members, it is thought by many of AA's friends that these pieces might arouse interest and find application outside AA itself. Many people, non-alcoholics, report that as a result of the practice of AA's 12 steps, they have been able to meet other difficulties of life. They think that the 12 steps can mean more than sobriety for problem drinkers. They see in them a way to happy and effective living for many, alcoholic or not. There is, too, a rising interest in the 12 traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. Students of human relations are beginning to wonder how and why AA functions as a society. Why is it, they ask, that in AA no member can be set in personal authority over another, that nothing like a central government can anywhere be seen? How can a set of traditional principles, having no legal force at all, hold the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous in unity and effectiveness? The second section of this volume, though designed for AA's membership, will give such inquirers an inside view of AA never before possible. Alcoholics Anonymous began in 1935 at Akron, Ohio, as the outcome of a meeting between a well-known surgeon and a New York broker. Both were severe cases of alcoholism and were destined to become co-founders of the AA Fellowship. The basic principles of AA, as they are known today, were borrowed mainly from the fields of religion and medicine, though some ideas upon which success finally depended were the result of noting the behavior and needs of the fellowship itself. After three years of trial and error in selecting the most workable tenets upon which the society could be based, and after a large amount of failure in getting alcoholics to recover, three successful groups emerged, the first at Akron, the second at New York, and the third at Cleveland. Even then it was hard to find two score of sure recoveries in all three groups. Nevertheless, the Infant Society determined to set down its experience in a book which finally reached the public in April 1939. At this time, the recoveries numbered about 100. The book was called Alcoholics Anonymous, and from it, the fellowship took its name. In it, alcoholism was described from the alcoholic's point of view. The spiritual ideas of the society were codified for the first time in the Twelve Steps, and the application of these steps to the alcoholic's dilemma was made clear. The remainder of the book was devoted to 30 stories or case histories in which the alcoholics described their drinking experiences and recoveries. This established identification with alcoholic readers and proved to them that the virtually impossible had now become possible. The book Alcoholics Anonymous became the basic text of the fellowship, and it still is. This present volume proposes to broaden and deepen the understanding of the Twelve Steps as first written in the earlier work. With the publication of the book Alcoholics Anonymous in 1939, the pioneering period ended, and a prodigious chain reaction set in as the recovered alcoholics carried their message to still others. 
In the next years, alcoholics flocked to AA by tens of thousands, largely as the result of excellent and continuous publicity freely given by magazines and newspapers throughout the world. Clergymen and doctors alike rallied to the new movement, giving it unstinted support and endorsement. This startling expansion brought with it very severe growing pains. Proof that alcoholics could recover had been made, but it was by no means sure that such great numbers of yet erratic people could live and work together with harmony and good effect. Everywhere there arose threatening questions of membership, money, personal relations, public relations, management of groups, clubs, and scores of other perplexities. It was out of this vast welter of explosive experience that AA's Twelve Traditions took form and were first published in 1946 and later confirmed at AA's first international convention held at Cleveland in 1950. The tradition section of this volume portrays in some detail the experience which finally produced the Twelve Traditions and so gave AA its present form, substance, and unity. As AA now enters maturity, it has begun to reach into forty foreign lands. In the view of its friends, this is but the beginning of its unique and valuable service. It is hoped that this volume will afford all who read it a close-up view of the principles and forces which have made Alcoholics Anonymous what it is. AA's General Service Office may be reached by writing Alcoholics Anonymous, P.O. Box 459, Grand Central Station, New York, New York, 10163, USA. Introduction Alcoholics Anonymous first published Twelve Steps and Twelve Traditions in 1953. Bill W., who, along with Dr. Bob S., founded Alcoholics Anonymous in 1935, wrote the book to share 18 years of collective experience within the fellowship on how AA members recover and how our society functions. In recent years, some members and friends of AA have asked if it would be wise to update the language, idioms, and historical references in the book to present a more contemporary image for the fellowship. However, because the book has helped so many alcoholics find recovery, there exists strong sentiment within the fellowship against any change to it. In fact, the 2002 General Service Conference discussed this issue and it was unanimously recommended that the text in the book Twelve Steps and Twelve Traditions, written by Bill W., remain as is, recognizing the fellowship's feelings that Bill's writing be retained as originally published. We hope that the collective spiritual experience of the AA pioneers captured in these pages continues to help alcoholics and friends of AA understand the principles of our program. The Twelve Steps Step 1. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Who cares to admit complete defeat? Practically no one, of course. Every natural instinct cries out against the idea of personal powerlessness. It is truly awful to admit that Glass in hand, we have warped our minds into such an obsession for destructive drinking that only an act of providence can remove it from us. No other kind of bankruptcy is like this one. Alcohol, now become the rapacious creditor, bleeds us of all self-sufficiency and all will to resist its demands. Once this stark fact is accepted, our bankruptcy, as going human concerns, is complete. But upon entering AA, we soon take quite another view of this absolute humiliation. We perceive that only through utter defeat are we able to take our first steps toward liberation and strength. 
our admissions of personal powerlessness finally turn out to be firm bedrock upon which happy and purposeful lives may be built. We know that little good can come to any alcoholic who joins AA unless he has first accepted his devastating weakness and all its consequences. Until he so humbles himself, his sobriety, if any, will be precarious. Of real happiness he will find none at all. Proved beyond doubt by an immense experience, this is one of the facts of AA life. The principle that we shall find no enduring strength until we first admit complete defeat is the main taproot from which our whole society has sprung and flowered. When first challenged to admit defeat, most of us revolted. We had approached AA expecting to be taught self-confidence. Then we had been told that so far as alcohol is concerned, self-confidence was no good whatever. In fact, it was a total liability. Our sponsors declared that we were the victims of a mental obsession so subtly powerful that no amount of human willpower could break it. There was, they said, no such thing as the personal conquest of this compulsion by the unaided will. Relentlessly deepening our dilemma, our sponsors pointed out our increasing sensitivity to alcohol. An allergy, they called it. The tyrant alcohol wielded a double-edged sword over us. First, we were smitten by an insane urge that condemned us to go on drinking, and then by an allergy of the body that ensured we would ultimately destroy ourselves in the process. Few indeed were those who, so assailed, had ever won through in single-handed combat. It was a statistical fact that alcoholics almost never recovered on their own resources. And this had been true, apparently, ever since man had first crushed grapes. In A.A.'s pioneering time, none but the most desperate cases could swallow and digest this unpalatable truth. Even these last gaspers often had difficulty in realizing how hopeless they actually were. But a few did, and when these laid hold of AA principles with all the fervor with which the drowning sees life preservers, they almost invariably got well. That is why the first edition of the book Alcoholics Anonymous, published when our membership was small, dealt with low-bottom cases only. Many less desperate alcoholics tried AA, but did not succeed because they could not make the admission of hopelessness. It is a tremendous satisfaction to record that in the following years, this changed. Alcoholics who still had their health, their families, their jobs, and even two cars in the garage, began to recognize their alcoholism. As this trend grew, they were joined by young people who were scarcely more than potential alcoholics. They were spared that last ten or fifteen years of literal hell the rest of us had gone through. Since step one requires an admission that our lives have become unmanageable, how could people such as these take this step? It was obviously necessary to raise the bottom the rest of us had hit to the point where it would hit them. By going back in our own drinking histories, we could show that years before we realized it, we were out of control, that our drinking even then was no mere habit, that it was indeed the beginning of a fatal progression. To the doubters, we could say, perhaps you're not an alcoholic after all. Why don't you try some more controlled drinking, bearing in mind, meanwhile, what we have told you about alcoholism? This attitude brought immediate and practical results. It was then discovered that when one alcoholic had planted in the mind of another the true nature of his malady, that person could never be the same again. Following every spree, he would say to himself, maybe those AAs were right. After a few such experiences, often years before the onset of extreme difficulties, 
he would return to us, convinced. He had hit bottom as truly as any of us. John Barleycorn himself had become our best advocate. Why all this insistence that every AA must hit bottom first? The answer is that few people will sincerely try to practice the AA program unless they have hit bottom. For practicing AA's remaining 11 steps means the adoption of attitudes and actions that almost no alcoholic who is still drinking can dream of taking. Who wishes to be rigorously honest and tolerant? Who wants to confess his faults to another and make restitution for harm done? Who cares anything about a higher power, let alone meditation and prayer? Who wants to sacrifice time and energy in trying to carry AA's message to the next sufferer? No, the average alcoholic, self-centered in the extreme, doesn't care for this prospect unless he has to do these things in order to stay alive himself. Under the lash of alcoholism, we are driven to AA, and there we discover the fatal nature of our situation. Then, and only then, do we become as open-minded to conviction and as willing to listen as the dying can be. We stand ready to do anything which will lift the merciless obsession from us. Step 2. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. The moment they read Step 2, most AA newcomers are confronted with a dilemma, sometimes a serious one. How often have we heard them cry out, Look what you people have done to us. You have convinced us that we are alcoholics and that our lives are unmanageable. Having reduced us to a state of absolute helplessness, you now declare that none but a higher power can remove our obsession. Some of us won't believe in God. Others can't. And still others who do believe that God exists have no faith whatever he will perform this miracle. Yes, you've got us over the barrel all right, but where do we go from here? Let's look first at the case of the one who says he won't believe, the belligerent one. He is in a state of mind which can be described only as savage. His whole philosophy of life, in which he so gloried, is threatened. It's bad enough, he thinks, to admit alcohol has him down for keeps. But now, still smarting from that admission, he is faced with something really impossible. How he does cherish the thought that man, risen so majestically from a single cell in the primordial ooze, is the spearhead of evolution and therefore the only God that his universe knows. Must he renounce all this to save himself? At this juncture... His AA sponsor usually laughs. This, the newcomer thinks, is just about the last straw. This is the beginning of the end. And so it is. The beginning of the end of his old life, and the beginning of his emergence into a new one. His sponsor probably says, Take it easy. The hoop you have to jump through is a lot wider than you think. At least I've found it so. So did a friend of mine who was a one-time vice president of the American Atheist Society, but he got through with room to spare. Well, says the newcomer, I know you're telling me the truth. It's no doubt a fact that AA is full of people who once believed as I do. But just how, in these circumstances, does a fellow take it easy? That's what I want to know. That, agrees the sponsor, is a very good question indeed. I think I can tell you exactly how to relax. You won't have to work at it very hard, either. Listen, if you will, to these three statements. First, Alcoholics Anonymous does not demand that you believe anything. All of its twelve steps are but suggestions. 
Second, to get sober and to stay sober, you don't have to swallow all of step two right now. Looking back, I find that I took it piecemeal myself. Third, all you really need is a truly open mind. Just resign from the debating society and quit bothering yourself with such deep questions as whether it was the hen or the egg that came first. Again, I say, all you need is the open mind. The sponsor continues. Take, for example, my own case. I had a scientific schooling. Naturally, I respected, venerated, even worshipped science. As a matter of fact, I still do, all except the worship part. Time after time, my instructors held up to me the basic principle of all scientific progress, search and research, again and again, always with the open mind. When I first looked at AA, my reaction was just like yours. This AA business, I thought, is totally unscientific. This I can't swallow. I simply won't consider such nonsense. Then I woke up. I had to admit that AA showed results, prodigious results. I saw that my attitude regarding these had been anything but scientific. It wasn't AA that had the closed mind. It was me. The minute I stopped arguing, I could begin to see and feel. Right there, step two gently and very gradually began to infiltrate my life. I can't say upon what occasion or upon what day I came to believe in a power greater than myself, but I certainly have that belief now. To acquire it, I had only to stop fighting and practice the rest of AA's program as enthusiastically as I could. This is only one man's opinion based on his own experience, of course. I must quickly assure you that AAs tread innumerable paths in their quest for faith. If you don't care for the one I've suggested, you'll be sure to discover one that suits, if only you look and listen. Many a man like you has begun to solve the problem by the method of substitution. You can, if you wish, make AA itself your higher power. Here's a very large group of people who have solved their alcohol problem. In this respect, they are certainly a power greater than you, who have not even come close to a solution. Surely you can have faith in them. Even this minimum of faith will be enough. You will find many members who have crossed the threshold just this way. All of them will tell you that, once across, their faith broadened and deepened. Relieved of the alcohol obsession, their lives unaccountably transformed, they came to believe in a higher power, and most of them began to talk of God. Consider next the plight of those who once had faith, but have lost it. There will be those who have drifted into indifference, those filled with self-sufficiency who have cut themselves off, those who have become prejudiced against religion, and those who are downright defiant because God has failed to fulfill their demands. Can AA experience tell all these they may still find a faith that works? Sometimes AA comes harder to those who have lost or rejected faith than to those who never had any faith at all, for they think they have tried faith and found it wanting. They have tried the way of faith and the way of no faith, since both ways have proved bitterly disappointing, they have concluded there is no place whatever for them to go. The roadblocks of indifference, fancied self-sufficiency, prejudice, and defiance often prove more solid and formidable for these people than any erected by the unconvinced agnostic or even the militant atheist. 
Religion says the existence of God can be proved. The agnostic says it can't be proved, and the atheist claims proof of the non-existence of God. Obviously, the dilemma of the wanderer from faith is that of profound confusion. He thinks himself lost to the comfort of any conviction at all. He cannot attain in even a small degree the assurance of the believer, the agnostic, or the atheist. He is the bewildered one. Any number of AAs can say to the drifter, Yes, we were diverted from our childhood faith, too. The overconfidence of youth was too much for us. Of course, we were glad that good home and religious training had given us certain values. We were still sure that we ought to be fairly honest, tolerant, and just, that we ought to be ambitious and hardworking. We became convinced that such simple rules of fair play and decency would be enough. As material success founded upon no more than these ordinary attributes began to come to us, we felt we were winning at the game of life. This was exhilarating, and it made us happy. Why should we be bothered with theological abstractions and religious duties, or with the state of our souls here or hereafter? The here and now was good enough for us. The will to win would carry us through. But then alcohol began to have its way with us. Finally, when all our scorecards read zero, and we saw that one more strike would put us out of the game forever, we had to look for our lost faith. It was in AA that we rediscovered it, and so can you. Now we come to another kind of problem. The intellectually self-sufficient man or woman. To these... Many AAs can say, Yes, we were like you, far too smart for our own good. We love to have people call us precocious. We used our education to blow ourselves up into prideful balloons, though we were careful to hide this from others. Secretly, we felt we could float above the rest of the folks on our brain power alone. Scientific progress told us there was nothing man couldn't do. Knowledge was all-powerful. Intellect could conquer nature. Since we were brighter than most folks, so we thought, the spoils of victory would be ours for the thinking. The god of intellect displaced the god of our fathers. But again, John Barleycorn had other ideas. We, who had won so handsomely in a walk, turned into all-time losers. We saw that we had to reconsider or die. We found many in AA who once thought as we did. They helped us to get down to our right size. By their example, they showed us that humility and intellect could be compatible, provided we placed humility first. When we began to do that, we received the gift of faith, a faith which works. This faith is for you, too. Another crowd of AAs says, We were plumb disgusted with religion and all its works. The Bible, we said, was full of nonsense. We could cite it chapter and verse, and we couldn't see the Beatitudes for the begats. In spots, its morality was impossibly good. In others, it seemed impossibly bad. But it was the morality of the religionists themselves that really got us down. We gloated over the hypocrisy, bigotry, and crushing self-righteousness that clung to so many believers even in their Sunday best. How we loved to shout the damaging fact that millions of the good men of religion were still killing one another off in the name of God. This all meant, of course, that we had substituted negative for positive thinking. After we came to AA, we had to recognize that this trait had been an ego-feeding proposition. In belaboring the sins of some religious people, we could feel superior to all of them. Moreover, we could avoid looking at some of our own shortcomings. Self-righteousness, the very thing that we had contemptuously condemned in others, was our own besetting evil. 
This phony form of respectability was our undoing, so far as faith was concerned. But finally, driven to AA, we learned better. As psychiatrists have often observed, defiance is the outstanding characteristic of many an alcoholic. So it's not strange that lots of us have had our day at defying God himself. Sometimes it's because God has not delivered us the good things of life which we specified as a greedy child makes an impossible list for Santa Claus. More often, though, we had met up with some major calamity and to our way of thinking lost out because God deserted us. The girl we wanted to marry had other notions. We prayed God that she'd change her mind, but she didn't. We prayed for healthy children and were presented with sick ones, or none at all. We prayed for promotions at business, and none came. Loved ones, upon whom we heartily depended, were taken from us by so-called acts of God. Then we became drunkards, and asked God to stop that. But nothing happened. This was the unkindest cut of all. Damn this faith business, we said. When we encountered AA, the fallacy of our defiance was revealed. At no time had we asked what God's will was for us. Instead, we had been telling him what it ought to be. No man, we saw, could believe in God and defy him too. Belief meant reliance not defiance. In AA, we saw the fruits of this belief. Men and women spared from alcohol's final catastrophe. We saw them meet and transcend their other pains and trials. We saw them calmly accept impossible situations, seeking neither to run nor to recriminate. This was not only faith. It was faith that worked under all conditions. We soon concluded that whatever price in humility we must pay, we would pay. Now let's take the guy full of faith, but still reeking of alcohol. He believes he is devout. His religious observance is scrupulous. He's sure he still believes in God, but suspects that God doesn't believe in him. He takes pledges and more pledges. Following each, he not only drinks again, but acts worse than the last time. Valiantly, he tries to fight alcohol, imploring God's help, but the help doesn't come. What, then, can be the matter? To clergymen, doctors, friends, and families, the alcoholic who means well and tries hard is a heartbreaking riddle. To most AAs, he is not. There are too many of us who have been just like him and have found the riddle's answer. This answer has to do with the quality of faith rather than its quantity. This has been our blind spot. We supposed we had humility when really we hadn't. We supposed we had been serious about religious practices when, upon honest appraisal, we found we had been only superficial. Or, going to the other extreme, we had wallowed in emotionalism and had mistaken it for true religious feeling. In both cases, we had been asking something for nothing. The fact was we really hadn't cleaned house, so that the grace of God could enter us and expel the obsession. In no deep or meaningful sense had we ever taken stock of ourselves, made amends to those we had harmed, or freely given to any other human being without any demand for reward. We had not even prayed rightly. We had always said, Grant me my wishes, instead of, Thy will be done. The love of God and man we understood not at all. Therefore we remained self-deceived, and so incapable of receiving enough grace to restore us to sanity. Few indeed are the practicing alcoholics who have any idea how irrational they are, or, seeing their irrationality, can bear to face it. 
Some will be willing to term themselves problem drinkers, but cannot endure the suggestion that they are in fact mentally ill. They are abetted in this blindness by a world which does not understand the difference between sane drinking and alcoholism. Sanity is defined as soundness of mind, yet no alcoholic, soberly analyzing his destructive behavior, whether the destruction fell on the dining room furniture or his own moral fiber, can claim soundness of mind for himself. Therefore, step two is the rallying point for all of us, whether agnostic, atheist, or former believer, we can stand together on this step. True humility and an open mind can lead us to faith, and every AA meeting is an assurance that God will restore us to sanity if we rightly relate ourselves to Him. Step 3. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. Practicing step three is like the opening of a door which to all appearances is still closed and locked. All we need is a key and the decision to swing the door open. There is only one key, and it is called willingness. Once unlocked by willingness, the door opens almost of itself, and looking through it, we shall see a pathway beside which is an inscription. It reads, This is the way to a faith that works. In the first two steps, we were engaged in reflection. We saw that we were powerless over alcohol, but we also perceived that faith of some kind, if only in AA itself, is possible to anyone. These conclusions did not require action, they required only acceptance. Like all the remaining steps, step three calls for affirmative action. For it is only by action that we can cut away the self-will which has always blocked the entry of God, or, if you like, a higher power, into our lives. Faith, to be sure, is necessary, but faith alone can avail nothing. We can have faith, yet keep God out of our lives. Therefore, our problem now becomes just how and by what specific means shall we be able to let Him in? Step three represents our first attempt to do this. In fact, the effectiveness of the whole AA program will rest upon how well and earnestly we have tried to come to a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. To every worldly and practical-minded beginner, this step looks hard, even impossible. No matter how much one wishes to try, exactly how can he turn his own will and his own life over to the care of whatever God he thinks there is? Fortunately, we who have tried it, and with equal misgivings, can testify that anyone, anyone at all, can begin to do it. We can further add that a beginning, even the smallest, is all that is needed. Once we have placed the key of willingness in the lock, and have the door ever so slightly open, we find that we can always open it some more. Though self-will may slam it shut again, as it frequently does, it will always respond the moment we again pick up the key of willingness. Maybe this all sounds mysterious and remote, something like Einstein's theory of relativity, or a proposition in nuclear physics. It isn't at all. Let's look at how practical it actually is. Every man and woman who has joined AA and intends to stick has, without realizing it, made a beginning on step three. Isn't it true that in all matters touching upon alcohol, each of them has decided to turn his or her life over to the care, protection, and guidance of Alcoholics Anonymous? Already a willingness has been achieved to cast out one's own will and one's own ideas about the alcohol problem in favor of those suggested by AA. Any willing newcomer feels sure AA is the only safe harbor for the foundering vessel he has become. 
Now, if this is not turning one's will and life over to a newfound providence, then what is it? But suppose that instinct still cries out, as it certainly will. Yes, respecting alcohol, I guess I have to be dependent upon AA. But in all other matters, I must still maintain my independence. Nothing is going to turn me into a non-entity. If I keep on turning my life and my will over to the care of something or somebody else, what will become of me? I'll look like the hole in the donut. This, of course, is the process by which instinct and logic always seek to bolster egotism and so frustrate spiritual development. The trouble is that this kind of thinking takes no real account of the facts. And the facts seem to be these. The more we become willing to depend upon a higher power, the more independent we actually are. Therefore, dependence, as AA practices it, is really a means of gaining true independence of the spirit. Let's examine for a moment this idea of dependence at the level of everyday living. In this area, it is startling to discover how dependent we really are and how unconscious of that dependence. Every modern house has electric wiring carrying power and light to its interior. We are delighted with this dependence. Our main hope is that nothing will ever cut off the supply of current. By so accepting our dependence upon this marvel of science, we find ourselves more independent personally. Not only are we more independent, we are even more comfortable and secure. Power flows just where it is needed. Silently and surely, electricity that strange energy so few people understand meets our simplest daily needs and our most desperate ones, too. Ask the polio sufferer confined to an iron lung who depends with complete trust upon a motor to keep the breath of life in him. But the moment our mental or emotional independence is in question, how differently we behave how persistently we claim the right to decide all by ourselves just what we shall think and just how we shall act. Oh, yes, we'll weigh the pros and cons of every problem. We'll listen politely to those who would advise us, but all the decisions are to be ours alone. Nobody is going to meddle with our personal independence in such matters. Besides, we think, there is no one we can surely trust. We are certain that our intelligence, backed by willpower, can rightly control our inner lives and guarantee us success in the world we live in. This brave philosophy, wherein each man plays God, sounds good in the speaking, but it still has to meet the acid test. How well does it actually work? One good look in the mirror ought to be answer enough for any alcoholic. Should his own image in the mirror be too awful to contemplate, and it usually is, he might first take a look at the results normal people are getting from self-sufficiency. Everywhere he sees people filled with anger and fear, society breaking up into warring fragments. Each fragment says to the others, We are right, and you are wrong. Every such pressure group, if it is strong enough, self-righteously imposes its will upon the rest. And everywhere the same thing is being done on an individual basis. The sum of all this mighty effort is less peace and less brotherhood than before. The philosophy of self-sufficiency is not paying off. Plainly enough, it is a bone-crushing juggernaut whose final achievement is ruin. Therefore, we who are alcoholics can consider ourselves fortunate indeed. Each of us has had his own near-fatal encounter with a juggernaut of self-will, and has suffered enough under its weight to be willing to look for something better. So it is by circumstance, rather than by any virtue, that we have been driven to AA, have admitted defeat, have acquired the rudiments of faith, and now want to make a decision to turn our will and our lives over to a higher power. 
We realize that the word dependence is as distasteful to many psychiatrists and psychologists as it is to alcoholics. Like our professional friends, we, too, are aware that there are wrong forms of dependence. We have experienced many of them. No adult man or woman, for example, should be in too much emotional dependence upon a parent. They should have been weaned long before, and if they have not been, they should wake up to the fact. This very form of faulty dependence has caused many a rebellious alcoholic to conclude that dependence of any sort must be intolerably damaging. But dependence upon an AA group, or upon a higher power, hasn't produced any baleful results. When World War II broke out, this spiritual principle had its first major test. AAs entered the services and were scattered all over the world. Would they be able to take discipline, stand up under fire, and endure the monotony and misery of war? Would the kind of dependence they had learned in AA carry them through? Well, it did. They had even fewer alcoholic lapses or emotional binges than AAs safe at home did. They were just as capable of endurance and valor as any other soldiers. Whether in Alaska or on the Salerno beachhead, their dependence upon a higher power worked. And far from being a weakness, this dependence was their chief source of strength. So how exactly can the willing person continue to turn his will and his life over to the higher power? He made a beginning, we have seen, when he commenced to rely upon AA for the solution of his alcohol problem. By now, though, the chances are that he has become convinced that he has more problems than alcohol and that some of these refuse to be solved by all the sheer personal determination and courage he can muster. They simply will not budge. They make him desperately unhappy and threaten his newfound sobriety. Our friend is still victimized by remorse and guilt when he thinks of yesterday. Bitterness still overpowers him when he broods upon those he still envies or hates. His financial insecurity worries him sick, and panic takes over when he thinks of all the bridges to safety that alcohol burned behind him. And how shall he ever straighten out that awful jam that cost him the affection of his family and separated him from them? His lone courage and unaided will cannot do it. Surely he must now depend upon somebody or something else. At first, that somebody is likely to be his closest AA friend. He relies upon the assurance that his many troubles now made more acute because he cannot use alcohol to kill the pain, can be solved, too. Of course the sponsor points out that our friend's life is still unmanageable, even though he is sober, that after all, only a bare start on AA's program has been made. More sobriety brought about by the admission of alcoholism and by attendance at a few meetings is very good indeed, but it is bound to be a far cry from permanent sobriety and a contented, useful life. That is just where the remaining steps of the AA program come in. Nothing short of continuous action upon these as a way of life can bring the much-desired result. Then it is explained that other steps of the AA program can be practiced with success only when step three is given a determined and persistent trial. This statement may surprise newcomers who have experienced nothing but constant deflation and a growing conviction that human will is of no value whatever. They have become persuaded, and rightly so, that many problems beside alcohol will not yield to a headlong assault powered by the individual alone. But now it appears that there are certain things which only the individual can do. All by himself, and in the light of his own circumstances, he needs to develop the quality of willingness. When he acquires willingness, he is the only one who can make the decision to exert himself. Trying to do this is an act of his own will. 
all of the twelve steps require sustained and personal exertion to conform to their principles and so, we trust, to God's will. It is when we try to make our will conform with God's that we begin to use it rightly. To all of us, this was a most wonderful revelation. Our whole trouble had been the misuse of willpower. We had tried to bombard our problems with it, instead of attempting to bring it into agreement with God's intention for us. To make this increasingly possible is the purpose of AA's 12 steps, and step 3 opens the door. Once we have come into agreement with these ideas, it is really easy to begin the practice of step three. In all times of emotional disturbance or indecision, we can pause, ask for quiet, and in the stillness simply say, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Thy will, not mine, be done. Step 4. Made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Creation gave us instincts for a purpose. Without them, we wouldn't be complete human beings. If men and women didn't exert themselves to be secure in their persons, made no effort to harvest food or construct shelter, there would be no survival. If they didn't reproduce, the earth wouldn't be populated. If there were no social instinct, if men cared nothing for the society of one another, there would be no society. So these desires for the sex relation, for material and emotional security, and for companionship, are perfectly necessary and right, and surely God-given. Yet these instincts, so necessary for our existence, often far exceed their proper functions. Powerfully, blindly, many times subtly, they drive us, dominate us, and insist upon ruling our lives. Our desires for sex, for material and emotional security, and for an important place in society often tyrannize us. When thus out of joint, man's natural desires cause him great trouble, practically all the trouble there is. No human being, however good, is exempt from these troubles. Nearly every serious emotional problem can be seen as a case of misdirected instinct. When that happens, our great natural assets, the instincts, have turned into physical and mental liabilities. Step four is our vigorous and painstaking effort to discover what these liabilities in each of us have been and are. We want to find exactly how, when, and where our natural desires have warped us. We wish to look squarely at the unhappiness this has caused others and ourselves. By discovering what our emotional deformities are, we can move toward their correction. Without a willing and persistent effort to do this, there can be little sobriety or contentment for us. Without a searching and fearless moral inventory, most of us have found that the faith which really works in daily living is still out of reach. Before tackling the inventory problem in detail, Let's have a closer look at what the basic problem is. Simple examples like the following take on a world of meaning when we think about them. Suppose a person places sex desire ahead of everything else. In such a case, this imperious urge can destroy his chances for material and emotional security as well as his standing in the community. Another may develop such an obsession for financial security that he wants to do nothing but hoard money. Going to the extreme, he can become a miser or even a recluse who denies himself both family and friends. Nor is the quest for security always expressed in terms of money. 
How frequently we see a frightened human being determined to depend completely upon a stronger person for guidance and protection. This weak one, failing to meet life's responsibilities with his own resources, never grows up. Disillusionment and helplessness are his lot. In time, all his protectors either flee or die, and he is once more left alone and afraid. We have also seen men and women who go power mad, who devote themselves to attempting to rule their fellows. These people often throw to the winds every chance for legitimate security and a happy family life. Whenever a human being becomes a battleground for the instincts, there can be no peace. But that is not all of the danger. Every time a person imposes his instincts unreasonably upon others, unhappiness follows. If the pursuit of wealth tramples upon people who happen to be in the way, then anger, jealousy, and revenge are likely to be aroused. If sex runs riot, there is a similar uproar. Demands made upon other people for too much attention, protection, and love can only invite domination or revulsion in the protectors themselves, two emotions quite as unhealthy as the demands which evoked them. When an individual's desire for prestige becomes uncontrollable, whether in the sewing circle or at the international conference table, other people suffer and often revolt. This collision of instincts can produce anything from a cold snub to a blazing revolution. In these ways we are set in conflict not only with ourselves, but with other people who have instincts too. Alcoholics especially should be able to see that instinct run wild in themselves is the underlying cause of their destructive drinking. We have drunk to drown feelings of fear, frustration, and depression. We have drunk to escape the guilt of passions, and then have drunk again to make more passions possible. We have drunk for vainglory, that we might the more enjoy foolish dreams of pomp and power. This perverse soul sickness is not pleasant to look upon. Instincts on rampage balk at investigation. The minute we make a serious attempt to probe them, we are liable to suffer severe reactions. If temperamentally we are on the depressive side, we are apt to be swamped with guilt and self-loathing. We wallow in this messy bog, often getting a misshapen and painful pleasure out of it. As we morbidly pursue this melancholy activity, we may sink to such a point of despair that nothing but oblivion looks possible as a solution. Here, of course, we have lost all perspective, and therefore all genuine humility. For this is pride in reverse. This is not a moral inventory at all. It is the very process by which the depressive has so often been led to the bottle and extinction. If, however, our natural disposition is inclined to self-righteousness or grandiosity, our reaction will be just the opposite. We will be offended at AA's suggested inventory. No doubt we shall point with pride to the good lives we thought we led before the bottle cut us down. We shall claim that our serious character defects, if we think we have any at all, have been caused chiefly by excessive drinking. This being so, we think it logically follows that sobriety, first, last, and all the time, is the only thing we need to work for. We believe that our one-time good characters will be revived the moment we quit alcohol. If we were pretty nice people all along, except for our drinking, what need is there for a moral inventory, now that we are sober? We also clutch at another wonderful excuse for avoiding an inventory. Our present anxieties and troubles, we cry, are caused by the behavior of other people people who really need a moral inventory. We firmly believe that if only they'd treat us better, we'd be all right. Therefore, we think our indignation is justified and reasonable, that our resentments are the right kind. We aren't the guilty ones. They are. 
At this stage of the inventory proceedings, our sponsors come to the rescue. They can do this, for they are the carriers of AA's tested experience with Step 4. They comfort the melancholy one by first showing him that his case is not strange or different, that his character defects are probably not more numerous or worse than those of anyone else in AA. This the sponsor promptly proves by talking freely and easily, and without exhibitionism, about his own defects, past and present. This calm yet realistic stock-taking is immensely reassuring. The sponsor probably points out that the newcomer has some assets which can be noted along with his liabilities. This tends to clear away morbidity and encourage balance. As soon as he begins to be more objective, the newcomer can fearlessly, rather than fearfully, look at his own defects. The sponsors of those who feel they need no inventory are confronted with quite another problem. This is because people who are driven by pride of self unconsciously blind themselves to their liabilities. These newcomers scarcely need comforting. The problem is to help them discover a chink in the walls their ego has built, through which the light of reason can shine. First off, they can be told that the majority of AA members have suffered severely from self-justification during their drinking days. For most of us, self-justification was the maker of excuses. Excuses, of course, for drinking, and for all kinds of crazy and damaging conduct. We had made the invention of alibis a fine art. We had to drink because times were hard, or times were good. We had to drink because at home we were smothered with love, or got none at all. We had to drink because at work we were great successes, or dismal failures. We had to drink because our nation had won a war, or lost a peace. And so it went, ad infinitum. We thought conditions drove us to drink, and when we tried to correct these conditions and found that we couldn't to our entire satisfaction, our drinking went out of hand, and we became alcoholics. It never occurred to us that we needed to change ourselves to meet conditions, whatever they were. But in AA, we slowly learned that something had to be done about our vengeful resentments, self-pity, and unwarranted pride. We had to see that every time we played the big shot, we turned people against us. We had to see that when we harbored grudges and planned revenge for such defeats, we were really beating ourselves with the club of anger we had intended to use on others. We learned that if we were seriously disturbed, our first need was to quiet that disturbance, regardless of who or what we thought caused it. To see how erratic emotions victimized us often took a long time. We could perceive them quickly in others, but only slowly in ourselves. First of all, we had to admit that we had many of these defects, even though such disclosures were painful and humiliating. Where other people were concerned, we had to drop the word blame from our speech and thought. This required great willingness even to begin. But once over the first two or three high hurdles, the course ahead began to look easier. For we had started to get perspective on ourselves, which is another way of saying that we were gaining in humility. Of course, the depressive and the power driver are personality extremes, types with which AA and the whole world abound. Often these personalities are just as sharply defined as the examples given, but just as often, some of us will fit more or less into both classifications. Human beings are never quite alike, so each of us, when making an inventory, will need to determine what his individual character defects are. Having found the shoes that fit, he ought to step into them and walk with new confidence that he is at last on the right track. Now let's ponder the need for a list of the more glaring personality defects all of us have in varying degrees. 
To those having religious training, such a list would set forth serious violations of moral principles. Some others will think of this list as defects of character. Still others will call it an index of maladjustments. Some will become quite annoyed if there is talk about immorality, let alone sin. But all who are in the least reasonable will agree upon one point, that there is plenty wrong with us alcoholics, about which plenty will have to be done if we are to expect sobriety, progress, and any real ability to cope with life. To avoid falling into confusion over the names these defects should be called, let's take a universally recognized list of major human failings, the seven deadly sins of pride, greed, lust, anger, gluttony, envy, and sloth. It is not by accident that pride heads the procession. For pride, leading to self-justification, and always spurred by conscious or unconscious fears, is the basic breeder of most human difficulties, the chief block to true progress. Pride lures us into making demands upon ourselves or upon others which cannot be met without perverting or misusing our God-given instincts. When the satisfaction of our instincts for sex, security, and society becomes the sole object of our lives, then pride steps in to justify our excesses. All these failings generate fear, a soul sickness in its own right. Then fear, in turn, generates more character defects. Unreasonable fear that our instincts will not be satisfied drives us to covet the possessions of others, to lust for sex and power, to become angry when our instinctive demands are threatened, to be envious when the ambitions of others seem to be realized while ours are not. We eat, drink, and grab for more of everything than we need, fearing we shall never have enough. And with genuine alarm at the prospect of work, we stay lazy. We loaf and procrastinate, or at best work grudgingly and under half steam. These fears are the termites that ceaselessly devour the foundations of whatever sort of life we try to build. So when AA suggests a fearless moral inventory, it must seem to every newcomer that more is being asked of him than he can do. Both his pride and his fear beat him back every time he tries to look within himself. Pride says, You need not pass this way. And fear says, you dare not look. But the testimony of AAs who have really tried a moral inventory is that pride and fear of this sort turn out to be bogeymen, nothing else. Once we have a complete willingness to take inventory and exert ourselves to do the job thoroughly, a wonderful light falls upon this foggy scene. As we persist, a brand new kind of confidence is born and the sense of relief at finally facing ourselves is indescribable. These are the first fruits of step four. By now, the newcomer has probably arrived at the following conclusions, that his character defects, representing instincts gone astray, have been the primary cause of his drinking and his failure at life, that unless he is now willing to work hard at the elimination of the worst of these defects, both sobriety and peace of mind will still elude him, that all the faulty foundation of his life will have to be torn out and built anew on bedrock. Now willing to commence the search for his own defects, he will ask, just how do I go about this? How do I take inventory of myself? Since step four is but the beginning of a lifetime practice, it can be suggested that he first have a look at those personal flaws which are acutely troublesome and fairly obvious. Using his best judgment of what has been right and what has been wrong, he might make a rough survey of his conduct with respect to his primary instincts for sex, security, and society. Looking back over his life, 
he can readily get under way by consideration of questions such as these. When and how and in just what instances did my selfish pursuit of the sex relation damage other people and me? What people were hurt and how badly? Did I spoil my marriage and injure my children? Did I jeopardize my standing in the community? Just how did I react to these situations at the time? Did I burn with a guilt that nothing could extinguish? Or did I insist that I was the pursued and not the pursuer, and thus absolve myself? How have I reacted to frustration in sexual matters? When denied, did I become vengeful or depressed? Did I take it out on other people? If there was rejection or coldness at home, did I use this as a reason for promiscuity? Also of importance for most alcoholics are the questions they must ask about their behavior respecting financial and emotional security. In these areas, fear, greed, possessiveness, and pride have too often done their worst. Surveying his business or employment record, almost any alcoholic can ask questions like these. In addition to my drinking problem, what character defects contributed to my financial instability? Did fear and inferiority about my fitness for my job destroy my confidence and fill me with conflict? Did I try to cover up those feelings of inadequacy by bluffing, cheating, lying, or evading responsibility? Or by griping that others failed to recognize my truly exceptional abilities? Did I overvalue myself and play the big shot? Did I have such unprincipled ambition that I double-crossed and undercut my associates? Was I extravagant? Did I recklessly borrow money, caring little whether it was repaid or not? Was I a pinch penny, refusing to support my family properly? Did I cut corners financially? What about the quick money deals, the stock market, and the races? Business women in AA will naturally find that many of these questions apply to them, too. But the alcoholic housewife can also make the family financially insecure. She can juggle charge accounts, manipulate the food budget, spend her afternoons gambling, and run her husband into debt by irresponsibility, waste, and extravagance. But all alcoholics who have drunk themselves out of jobs, family, and friends will need to cross-examine themselves ruthlessly to determine how their own personality defects have thus demolished their security. The most common symptoms of emotional insecurity are worry, anger, self-pity, and depression. These stem from causes which sometimes seem to be within us, and at other times to come from without. To take inventory in this respect, we ought to consider carefully all personal relationships which bring continuous or recurring trouble. It should be remembered that this kind of insecurity may arise in any area where instincts are threatened. Questioning directed to this end might run like this. Looking at both past and present, what sex situations have caused me anxiety, bitterness, frustration, or depression. Appraising each situation fairly, can I see where I have been at fault? Did these perplexities beset me because of selfishness or unreasonable demands? Or, if my disturbance was seemingly caused by the behavior of others, why do I lack the ability to accept conditions I cannot change? These are the sort of fundamental inquiries that can disclose the source of my discomfort and indicate whether I may be able to alter my own conduct and so adjust myself serenely to self-discipline. Suppose that financial insecurity constantly arouses these same feelings. I can ask myself to what extent have my own mistakes fed my gnawing anxieties. And if the actions of others are part of the cause, what can I do about that? 
If I am unable to change the present state of affairs, am I willing to take the measures necessary to shape my life to conditions as they are? Questions like these, more of which will come to mind easily in each individual case, will help turn up the root causes. But it is from our twisted relations with family, friends, and society at large that many of us have suffered the most. We have been especially stupid and stubborn about them. The primary fact that we fail to recognize is our total inability to form a true partnership with another human being. Our egomania digs two disastrous pitfalls. Either we insist upon dominating the people we know, or we depend upon them far too much. If we lean too heavily on people, they will sooner or later fail us, for they are human too, and cannot possibly meet our incessant demands. In this way, our insecurity grows and festers. When we habitually try to manipulate others to our own willful desires, they revolt and resist us heavily. Then we develop hurt feelings, a sense of persecution, and a desire to retaliate. As we redouble our efforts at control and continue to fail, our suffering becomes acute and constant. We have not once sought to be one in a family to be a friend among friends, to be a worker among workers, to be a useful member of society. Always we tried to struggle to the top of the heap or to hide underneath it. This self-centered behavior blocked a partnership relation with any one of those about us. Of true brotherhood, we had small comprehension. Some will object to many of the questions posed because they think their own character defects have not been so glaring. To these, it can be suggested that a conscientious examination is likely to reveal the very defects the objectionable questions are concerned with. Because our surface record hasn't looked too bad, we have frequently been abashed to find that this is so simply because we have buried these self-same defects deep down in us under thick layers of self-justification. Whatever the defects, they have finally ambushed us into alcoholism and misery. Therefore, thoroughness ought to be the watchword when taking inventory. In this connection, it is wise to write out our questions and answers. It will be an aid to clear thinking and honest appraisal. It will be the first tangible evidence of our complete willingness to move forward.